Welcome to Excel 2013. In this series of videos, I'm going to go over some of the basic concepts and also some intermediate concepts as well on how to use Microsoft Excel and particularly version 2013. As we get started here, it is important to understand that I'll be approaching this application starting with the basic concepts and then moving to more difficult ones or more generalized concepts that you'd use in a business environment. So without wasting any more time here, let's get started. So on the very top left hand side, we have here the quick access toolbar. And the quick access toolbar is basically a bunch of icons that you can park here for you to access most commonly used functions. So if you are always, for example, going to the insert tab and you're inserting a table or you're inserting a pivot table or a chart and so on, you can always right click on that icon and choose to add it to the quick access toolbar. And then at any point in the future, when you're working with a document, all you'd have to do is you'd click on the quick access toolbar here on that particular icon. If for some reason you do not want that icon on the toolbar at any point, you can right click on it again and then choose to remove it from the quick access toolbar. So here on the left hand side, you have the file menu. The file menu, it will give you these different sub options or subcategories here, such as information about the document, inspecting the document, different versions of the document. Then under new here, this is where you'd create a new spreadsheet and then open an existing one, saving a document, saving it as, and so on. Now, one thing that I would like to mention here is that if you're doing the subscription based version of it, this is where you'd have the email address for this Microsoft Office activation. This is where you can basically further customize Excel to your liking. So you can go and change the general preferences here. Then you have the save option. This is where you change where your documents would be located and how often to auto save them. So now all this stuff here in the very top, this is referred to as the office ribbon. This is new starting with office 2007 then 2010. So these are the tabs and then within each tab here you have these groupings of functions or functionality such as the font section here, the alignment grouping, the number, grouping and then the styles and then the cells and so on. The way it kind of works is that you start a spreadsheet and I'll explain what spreadsheets are in a moment here. You start a spreadsheet and you work from the home tab. The home tab has the most commonly used functions that you'll perform in that spreadsheet. And then as you're working through the spreadsheet, then you go and insert other components to that spreadsheets and this is very similar in Microsoft Word you start with a basic home tab and you move through the different other tabs on the bottom right here this is where you can zoom in and out of the document now there's uh, other stuff here for example such as page layout and the normal view and then in the bottom left here this is where you have the different sheets so uh, the way Excel kind of works is very similar think of it like a notebook you have the different pages in the notebook. You can right click and change those worksheets, give them different names. So you could call it week one, you could call this week two, and you can also color them. So you could have tab different tab colors for each one of them. So now within each worksheet here, notice you have these vertical lines and then horizontal lines and then you have these squares. These are referred to as the actual cells. So in this case, this reference right here, it would be C3. So you basically take the column and then the row, wherever they meet, you start with the column and then you label it. So that's the address for this specific cell. So if I have 50 here, and then I want to post the value that is on this location somewhere else, 
equal sign and then whatever the reference is here C3 and if I hit enter notice it posts my value if I change it over here it'll change it in the other location as well so basically well, all that is to say that you have these references now you have the rows and the columns of course now in each of those cells you can enter text basically you can enter any of this stuff you can it can be a general number or letters it can be numbers it can be currency it can be accounting it can be a date format it can be percentages and it can be of course text and it can also be formulas that you can implement and post in there for example right here I was able to put a formula now one key component to remember when using Excel is that all formulas start with an equal sign and that works pretty much in most spreadsheet software it works especially in any version of Excel so that's how you're telling the computer that I'm entering in that specific cell it's going to be a formula right below the ribbon you have this other toolbar it shows you what the formula bar is or the function bar so in this case I had entered the formula here it was 60 so equal 60 it's just posting our references in here you'll have the different functions or what's also referred to as the name manager and I'll cover those too at some point in the future keeping in mind there are different worksheets within a workbook you can have a lot of them you can have up to a million records or a million rows in a spreadsheet in Excel and I believe this can go up to 16,000 columns so that concludes the first session here on using Excel please check the other videos that follow this if you want to proceed with other components of learning Excel in this session I'm going to go through some of the basic functions and concepts on using Microsoft Excel so what I have done here is I just have a sample spreadsheet and in this spreadsheet basically I just have some basic text for now just ignore all this stuff it's just what I'm going to cover in this session so like I explained in the previous session as well each of those cells can contain data or numbers or it can contain calculations as well the idea of using Microsoft Excel by the way it is so that you can perform various calculations you add numbers and then the computer will calculate those values automatically and the and what's best is also to format and actually as soon as you change part of the data those totals those calculations to be updated automatically so that's one of the benefits the other thing is that you can analyze the data and you can create charts and you can look at data in a visual way basically so but before we can get there we have to understand the con the basic concepts here so in this case let's start with some text stuff so I have here let's say using Excel now what you can do of course you can highlight this and then make this larger now the other thing that you can do is if you wanted to center it you can highlight a whole bunch of cells that you want here and then just simply choose merge and center notice here down now in this section you can also have various other options as well so merge and center now just the font somewhat now notice that my text here it's kind of messed up a little bit I should have done the merge and center earlier or now that I did it later what I need to do is expand the width of this column or the width of the row here and by the way the, the way you change that width is by holding the mouse between the rows here and moving it either up or down and the same way it works with moving it the columns in between here and you adjust the width now if you had to notice here uh, you have miscellaneous expenses it's not covered it's not exposed completely one of the ways is either to expand it like that manually or you can either do double click on it double clicking on it it will adjust it to the farthest width 
Now it's messing it up for me because I have this down here. So that's why it's going all the way to the far right. So now let's bring it back. And there we go. And let's adjust also the width again. And there we go again. So then formatting the text, of course, you have all this stuff over here, very similar to Microsoft Word or, you know, editing a text document. So that's as far as just basic formatting. Now, before you go and spend too much time on doing this formatting stuff and spending all afternoon tinkering with adjustments, keep in mind that there are some options here, for example, for the cell styles under formatting the different styles as if you have watched the Microsoft Word tutorial, basically the way it works is that Microsoft, and this is where it actually shines better than other applications out there, is that it has predefined styles to save you time and make things look much more visually acceptable. So in this case, if we go to format this, for example, we can go here under cell styles and just pick one of those styles that already exists in the computer. And notice as you hold the mouse on these styles, it'll give you an automatic preview or what's called the technical term is live preview. So there we have it. Most You may not want it that big, but you can still customize that style if you wanted to do that. Now, here we have other text as well. We are not going to tinker with the text at this point anymore. You get the idea, I hope. Now, in these numbers here, we'll assume that these are dollars. So in this case, we want to format these numbers in, uh, into dollars or currency. The way you can do that is a couple ways here. You can either click on this dollar sign here, which is accounting number format, or you can go up over here in the drop down and then click on currency. So either one of them will work fine. If you're using other currencies, you can click on the drop down and you have here the different other currencies, the common ones. So now that we have this, by the way, we probably want that formatting to be applied to those other totals because what I'm going to do next here is we're going to calculate, let's say these are office expenses, and I want to calculate the totals for January and then also the totals across the different months for, let's say, training. So in that case, I probably want this formatted into currencies. I can go ahead and click on that. So now that we have this bunch of numbers, let's learn a couple of the basic functions here. So what I mean by that is uh, how can we add these numbers without you having to either take your calculator out and do it manually or doing somehow a different mathematical way here. So before I can show you the faster way, I'll show you the manual way of doing it. So if you remember from before, and try to keep this in mind, all formulas start in Excel, start with the equal sign, the equal sign there. So so in order for us to get these totals, we basically have to use a formula. Now the formulas, they start, there are three pieces to them. There is the, uh, the equal sign that tells it it's a formula. Then there is a function. You basically, you're telling the computer what you want to do. For example, we want to get the sum of those numbers. That's a function. And then it is also the range, the range of the numbers that we want to calculate. So we want this whole range here. So there are three pieces to them, equal sign, function, and then the range. Functions, and hopefully I'm not confusing you at this point, there are hundreds of them. So if you go here under formulas and you click on insert function and you click on all of them, notice it's a lot of different functions in Excel. And in this tutorial, there's no way I can cover all of them. So I'll just cover the most common ones, also giving you some concepts on how to use Excel and you can explore it later yourself. So as you can see, there are hundreds and hundreds of functions here. So for example, if we wanted to do the sum, 
this is the function and it says it adds all the numbers in a range of cells and if you wanted to learn more about that specific function you can click on help here and it will show you the how to perform that specific function and here is it gives you examples on how to perform those functions and so on various different ways of representing that data I'm going to demonstrate you this one over here in this example so let's go back here and now like I said earlier you have the equal sign the function and then the range so in this case I want to get the total for these so now what we do here we hit the end we press enter and type equal sign then the sum and then the range that of the numbers that you want to calculate let me do it the manual way first the range we can do it manually so c5 colon c13 and then close parentheses so that's the manual way of doing it. So we are saying equal sign, give me the, the sum of from C5 all the way through C13. Now one thing to keep in mind is that even if that is empty, you might want to include that in the range because at some point you might insert a number and that will be calculated automatically. So now that I have selected the range here, so that colon here represents the whole range from the starting point to the end point, I hit enter and it gives me the uh, the total for those numbers now the nice thing and this is where Excel comes into uh, play is that you have a bunch of numbers and if I change this bunch of numbers to let's say one dollar there notice the total is going to change automatically and that's the beauty of Excel now the next thing here is I want to calculate let's say the total for February as well so I could do the equal sign and then sum that's my function and then the other way to instead of you typing it manually d d5 through d13 i could simply select it and this is another way of doing this select the range and hit enter again that was equal sign type the function select the range and then hit enter and then notice 1972 now another way of doing this and this is the third method or the third way of doing it is that if you go here under the home tab you can also click on under editing you can click on auto sum and notice it selects it automatically in this case it's kind of trying to do the work for you however in some cases you'll find out that it's not doing it right so I'd always recommend that you verify the range that it's calculating in this case it's okay hit enter it's done now so that's a couple ways of entering this so just rewind the video to view them how that is done now let me show you another method of doing this so now let's say instead of me wasting my afternoon let's say I have 13 columns here that I need to get the totals well, it's kind of repetitious it's doing the same thing so I want the sum of C5 through C13 then I want the sum of D6 through D13 and then and on and on to the right there's a functionality in Excel where you can autofill these formulas so all you have to do for the autofill what I mean by that is put the formula in here instead of you having to create it manually is basically hold down the mouse where this little corner dot is in the bottom let me make this bigger so you hold the mouse down and then you drag it to the right and that is the autofill feature so now notice it has updated itself to the Five, and then here to e5 so it has gone one over sequentially so that works going from left to right sequentially or top to bottom so for example if we have here the equal the, the total for training for January equal sum and then 
this range, hit enter. Now let's say instead of me having to enter it for every one of those, I can simply use the auto fill feature. Now drag it down and there it is. It gives you the whole total. Always again verify those values. Now let me explain a little bit how the autofill works. So autofill works for anything that is in sequence as I showed you a moment ago. So if we have January, let's go back here, and let's say we want to enter the months of the year. So you just simply drag this down and it just keeps on going in a sequence. Let's say you have the days of the week, drag it down, it goes in a sequence. It can do things out of sequence as well if you need it to. So for example, uh, let's say you want one and four. Let's say you want to uh, skip three numbers every so often. So what you do in this case is you highlight both of those and then it's going to replicate that in that sequence. So one, four, seven, ten, thirteen, and so on. So it's a pretty neat way of populating a whole range with whatever pattern that you need. If you're using numbers, let me try to delete this. You may find something like this. It doesn't change. It doesn't go cons consecutively. So it doesn't increase the order. In this case, to use the autofill, notice there is a drop down here. And you can choose, click on the drop down, and then choose fill series, and it'll fill them up. Or if you hold the control key while you're dragging it down, it'll do the sequential thing as well. So that's the autofill feature and a couple of the basic concepts here on how to enter a formula and also how to get the maximum. Actually, we'll get to the maximum average and all that type of stuff in a moment here. So now, and hopefully this video is not getting too long here, but let me show you very easily and quickly how to create, to calculate the maximum or to find the highest number in a range of values. So in here, let's say I want to find the highest number. So what I do is I can put the, again, put the equal sign and then I want to, let's say I don't know anything about Excel or not, I'm thinking the maximum, probably it's represented by max or something like that. So notice it comes up with max and then it even tells you what it does. So you can double click on it and then simply select the range, hit enter. So it's saying here that the highest number is 500. If I have, let's say, 11,000 there, notice now 11,000 is updated. If I want to find the highest number for all the other columns here, all you have to do is move this to the right, and then it will populate those values. Now let's find the lowest number, the minimum. So equal, the equal sign, the function and then the range in parentheses hit enter and then use the auto fill if you want to find the average equal sign you might have to double click there on that not hit enter and hit enter at the very end and then use the auto fill if you want to count how many items we have here you might have a spreadsheet with 2000 records and instead of having to count them manually you can just have a formula for it so you do equal count and by the way this stuff it's also up here under the auto sum area there is also count numbers count how many numbers and that was because i had it inserted already an equal sign there so if you're going to use the stuff from the top you don't start with equal it'll do it itself for you so let's say count numbers and all we have to do is select the range that we want to count and notice it says nine and so on all right so those are a couple of the functions and how the formulas work and how the autofill function works the average minimum counting and maximum as well so in the next video i'm going to go over some other calculations mathematical calculations using excel 
so stay tuned. In this session, I'm going to go over a couple other basic arithmetic functions using Microsoft Excel. So earlier we learned about finding the totals here for a bunch of numbers. And then we learned about the autofill feature. We learned about finding maximum, minimum, and average, and count. So now we are going to learn some basic financial calculations. So let's say you're doing payroll or you're doing some kind of expense report or something of that nature. And this is one of the key features that you'll use in Excel. So let's say you have the pay for these employees, and then there are deductions that you're taking off their pay for various reasons. You want to calculate what the total for their deductions is, and then you want to calculate their net pay. So in this case, first let's format this into dollar amounts, and then let's go back and calculate here what the total for deductions would be. So the easiest way to do that, so in this case, like we learned earlier, is equal sign, sum, and then it's going to be the total for the two deductions. Just simply select those two references. It is important, I cannot stress this enough, instead of you calculating 234, 43, plus 54, 83, always use the references, the addresses for those values. Because the reason for that is because if you change the value in the future, your formula is going to be broken. So you hit enter, and now we have 289. You could do the same thing for the next one if you needed to. However, we can be wise and simply use something that we learned from before. We can use the autofill feature. Just hold the mouse on the bottom point here, and then drag it down. So these are the totals for the deductions. Now let's calculate what the net pay would be. So that would be the gross pay minus uh, the deductions, and that's what they would be taking home. So in this case, what we need to do is we put the equal sign, and then we take the C23, the total pay, minus the deductions the total deductions. And then we simply hit enter. So in this case, we don't necessarily have to use a function for like after the equal sign. We are just doing the calculation between two values. So we hit enter, and this is the total for that employee. Again, equal sign, first reference, minus the deductions and hit enter. Again, we can use the autofill feature here. So that was the subtraction. Now, if we wanted to, let's say, find out, let's say this is, let's do the annual net. So let's say that we are going to find how much that employee is making a year, whether it's, in this case, let's do the simple, uh, the net pay. So what we do here is equal the amount times 12. In this case, I usually do not recommend that you actually put static values in there, and I'll explain the reason why. So for now, we say 12 months times that, so that comes to 41,000. You do the autofill, that's their net pay. Now notice, whenever you see this, these number signs here, what that means is that the column here, it's not wide enough for this number to fit in. So what you have to do is you move the mouse between the two columns on the top and you just expand it or you can you could have double clicked on it and it'll have expanded it exactly to the highest or to the widest point. Now let's say that we want to calculate the pay per week and I want to show you how you do division in Microsoft Excel. So if you only to do the division or the pay per week, now so we suppose this is 41,000 a year. So we do the equal sign, whatever the amount annual is, divided, the division is represented by the slash, and then 52. 
hit enter that's the weekly pay for that employee so that's division again it's the slash the multiplication was represented in the previous calculation here it's represented by the use of the asterisk those are the four functions so you can utilize them in uh, most of what you'll be doing in Excel it can be you can be 90% I would say is going to involve those four functions the adding of a whole bunch of numbers the subtraction that you learned from here for the calculation of the net pay and then the multiplication and then division as well then you can incorporate also those other functions that we covered earlier now one last thing before I move to the next section here I mentioned earlier that it's not recommended that you use actual numbers here for example the to calculate the annual pay times 12 it's best to just somewhere instead of using 12 there you could say pay periods or and then you just set it at say 12 over here so you use a reference point so in this case instead of you having it as 12 you could have that referencing j17 the reason for that is because you might say okay well what would be the pay period for six months so you could just change it simply to six and now it will update it automatically you don't have to go and tinker with the formulas notice here i have this formula it was j17 and when i did use the autofill it, these became just blank the reason for that i'll explain it in the next video that is a good uh, way for us to move to the next video here in this session i'm going to explain or at least try to explain the various types of references in microsoft excel it's somewhat of a difficult concept to grasp but it is very widely used if you want it to be successful in using microsoft excel and get somewhat of a good grasp on using it so notice on uh, the previous video that i covered uh, i was referencing here instead of using numbers for as part of the formula instead use references for example the pay periods instead of putting times six or times 12 in here to get the annual pay for the employee you'd reference it to the number of pay periods somewhere referenced somewhere else in another cell but when we did that if you notice that this when i use the autofill feature that those cells what happened that they got messed up so for example notice we have g 23 times j 17. if we go to the next thing you have g 24 times j 18 so what happened there was it's going one further down below our pay period then if we go, drop down to the next one notice it sh it went down to two and that's because we went down so the way autofill works is that it goes sequentially one to one relationship now that leads us to the types of references in excel those references that we used here like g23 and j17 those are relative references so in excel you have three types of references you have relative references so that's relative to the location where they are absolute references and mixed references what that would mean is that so for example five percent here to express it as a relative reference we could express that simply by typing equal and then c4 notice that's the relative reference it's not locked it's not any of that type of stuff now absolute references you can express that by c4 but if you put dollar signs to both the column and the row that makes it an absolute reference that means that wherever you're using the dollar signs it's always not going to shift down on you so dollar signs 
that's what makes them absolute references. So notice at this point it's still showing me 5%, the actual content of it, but it just has a dollar sign. Now one other thing here in the dollar signs, if instead of you having to type the dollar sign manually as part of a formula, you can press the F4 key on the keyboard and that will change between a relative reference to an absolute reference with the dollar signs to a mixed reference. And a mixed reference can be one where only part of the reference has a dollar sign. So in this case, it is the row that is being locked down. Like notice the dollar sign is in front of number C4 here, so for four. And then the other type of mixed reference here would be, I'm pressing F4 again, notice the dollar sign now switched places and we are locking it by the column. So there are different uses for locking just the column or just the row, and but let me explain it a little bit further here. So, so the relative reference here would be C4, and I'm just typing it at this point. The absolute reference would be dollar C, dollar four, and they don't have to be capitalized. A mixed reference could be either one of them. It could be dollar C and then number four, or C and then dollar four. Let me explain the difference between the relative and absolute references in this example. So let's say we have a budget for your department of $20,000 a year. And because of the economy or because of whatever reason, you need to decrease your budget by 5%. So your boss comes to you and says, training is not gonna be $4,000 anymore, you have to give up 5% and then office supplies, the same and so on. Now you have to calculate what your difference will be. So in this cell here on D6, we are gonna calculate the difference. So the difference in this point, if you remember the previous tutorials, you calculate it by putting the equal sign and then you do 4,000, which will be C6 times 5%. So in this case, we just click on the C4, that's our reference, hit enter. Notice we have to give up $200. Now if you did this, you can go manually and do this for every cell here and it will work just fine. However, if you wanted to make it easier for yourself and simply drag this down by using the autofill feature, notice that things will not work correctly. Notice it says $200 for the first one, and then we have to give up $32 million for computer expenses when we had only $8,000. So what's happening here? What's happening is that notice on the first one, it's calculating 4,000 times 5%. On the second one, which is C6 times C4. On the next one, it's gonna be C7 times C5. So it went one down, which means it's calculating 100 times blank. So 100 times zero, it's zero. On the next one, it's going C8 times C6. So it's calculating 8,000 times 4,000. So it's shifting one at a time. So what we want to do is we want to lock it for this 5% so it stays put. So to lock it, all you have to do is make this C4, make it an absolute reference. So you can do the F4 there. Notice it puts a dollar signs, two of them. Hit enter. For the first reference, it doesn't change anything. It's still the same $200, but if you populate this down to the rest, notice we have the proper value. So 5% of 2,000, it's $100 in this case that we have to give up. So that's basically why you to use the references. Now, if you wanted to change this to 8%, all you have to change is this number, 8%, and notice those values are updated automatically. So hopefully that makes sense on why you would use the absolute references here. It's basically so that you don't run into the same problem that we did over here as well. So now to correct this one, all we have to do is we come over here and we want to make this value, J17, we want to make it an absolute reference. So we do F4, or you put the dollar signs manually, but F4 is gonna be much easier to change the mode there. Hit enter, 
then use the auto fill and now we have the correct calculations so that's the difference between relative references relative references don't have the dollar sign they kind of jump sequentially as you use the auto fill feature and absolute references where you're pointing to a specific cell and you don't want it to move you want it to stay put the difference for the mixed references what that means is that you're locking it either by just the column so let's say you have a bunch of references for different rates and you want to lock them by the column in that case you'd lock it put the dollar sign in front of the column whatever it would be a c whatever and then if you had multiple values in a row so let's say let's say 10 percent here and then 12 percent and so on and you want to lock it only by the row then you'd use the dollar sign by number four you're telling it it's let it move down from column to column but not the rows let it be locked at that point there are less common uses for that i'm not going to spend the time to explain it for the sake of your saving your time here so now in this case if you wanted to calculate the new budget you'd click on the equal sign here and you say my new budget is 4000 minus this value hit enter and then drag it down and then everything gets correct of course double check it and that should explain the use of absolute and relative references so at this point I'm going to show you just briefly a couple of things as far as the conditional formatting that is available in Excel 2013 so let's say you have a data very similar to this and you want to format this data and also analyze it to some extent so what you can do is you can highlight it and then you go here under conditional formatting or actually before I go to conditional formatting just like you remember from using styles you can also format this using specific different other types of predefined styles of tables and you can even customize it further here notice on the design we have further options that you can tinker with okay so uh, let's say we have this now at this point let's say uh, like I was mentioning earlier we want to analyze this data and kind of make it more visual so what you can do is and notice we are in the home tab and you can go here under conditional formatting so basically conditional formatting it as it, it shows here in the explanation it easily allows you to spot trends and patterns in your data using bars colors icons and other visually important components to highlight specific data so you click here on uh, conditional formatting and then you can analyze or change things so that for example you want data bars the higher values will have the higher bar here appropriately so that's one way to use to represent this data the different values so if the value is lower now this the whole thing will change again and by the way let's undo the previous formatting that we had applied to it and go back and utilize a different type of formatting and you can define different rules here as well so you can just go and check the rules here so if it's a specific value a specific value falls between a certain range and so on formatted a certain way and displayed in a different color and that type of thing the other one is you can use icons and a variety of different ways you can also use a top 10 percent to highlight the top 10 the bottom 10 above average below average and so on on a whole bunch of values if you right click on the data that we selected if you use here the quick analysis and this is new in 2013 they'll give you a live preview of how this data will look if you chose that specific component so it's a little bit more useful this way by right clicking on it you can also pick different types of charts to represent it the totals what they'll look like and make it sparkly with different types of 
visual data representation, that type of thing. That's conditional formatting and some of the analysis tools that you can utilize in Excel. Hopefully you find it helpful and next we're going to move into data sorting and filtering. In this session on Excel, I'm going to demonstrate how to use data filtering and sorting. Let's assume that we have this data and now we want to sort this data. So let's say we want to sort the data by date here. And it actually seems like it's sorted by date already. So let's sort it by product. So all you have to do to sort it by a specific field here is click anywhere in that column or in that field that you want to sort by. And then you click on sort under the home tab and then choose sort A to Z or the other way around. So that would be alphabetically basically. And now notice everything has been sorted alphabetically. If I wanted to sort a different way, let's say now by date, because notice it has been changed. You click here on sort A through Z and you could start with the oldest to the newest or however your preference is. And notice now the data has been sorted again. So again, it's very easy. Select the column where the, that you want to sort by, and then you just go and sort and filter. Or you can simply right click and choose here under sort A through Z. So, and that's another tip and another concept, and especially if you're using Windows, to right click on components and see what options are available. So now I sort it by region. So now let's learn about filtering data in Excel. Another powerful feature that you can utilize in Excel is the filtering of the data. So let's say we want to see only the sales for the East section or the East region. Let's say we don't want to any of the other data. To, to filter by a specific region, we have to do two things. First, we have to enable filtering, and then we have to choose the criteria for that filtering. So how do we enable filtering? Very simple is by simply going here under sort and filter and then click on filter. Notice as soon as you click on filter, now you have this drop down arrows here under each heading for your data. In this case, all you have to do is pick the region or pick the filter that you want to apply. So let's say we want it only the East region. So we click on the drop down and then we unselect everything else and we choose only the eastern region click ok it has applied it has hidden basically it filtered out all the other regions except for the eastern region now let's say that i wanted to have the eastern region but i want to see by a specific salesman so let's say i want only franks so i click on the drop down and I unselect everything else and I choose only Franks. And now I have two filters applied and you know which ones have been filtered by the application, by the icon here. So the idea here is that, that you can filter something by using multiple components for your filtering or multiple filters. To unfilter something here, so let's say I don't want Franks or I want to add more salespeople, I can choose whatever I want, click OK, and now it's filtered again. Two filters, region plus salesperson. To remove the filter, you can click on the filter icon, then click on clear filter from sales rep, and then that has been removed. To remove the next filter, we're going to drop down, clear filter from region. Another way to filter is, or just like sorting, right click, choose filter, and then you have the option here to filter by a selected value. So let's say I wanted to see the product sunshine, let's say, right click, choose filter. And now I have only the filter for that specific cell that I had selected. To clear the filter, you just right click as well. Another thing that you can do is you can also filter by a specific criteria and let's say in these values let's say we want to see only the sales or items higher than a thousand dollars notice we don't have any other filters at this point but we are going to do the filter only by the sales a thousand dollars or higher we click here on the drop down 
and you can also filter by other criteria like number filters and it says equal or greater than or between or top 10 or below average and so on so you're basically you could have a spreadsheet with 200,000 records and you want to display only your top 10 percent customers you can utilize that by ap applying one of those filters so in this case we want greater than and we'll say greater than a thousand and then click OK and notice here are the values greater than a thousand if you wanted to sort this of course you can right click choose sort smallest to largest and now notice 1026 1058 and all that type of stuff so it's a very powerful function very easy to use I guess if you know which button to click but hopefully it helps it's one of those things by the way that it's very commonly used in the business world in this session I'm going to explain how to use charts how to create and use charts in Excel 2013 so let's say we have some data and the data can be very simple like a bunch of three categories for example with three types of sales and we want to represent this data in a more visual way and because if you look at this data by just numbers it's probably not as meaningful for you to identify what's happening so what you do to create a chart for this data is you simply select the range that has the data for example with the labels it's helpful usually to include the labels for example we are saying here boomerangs there are 22,000 in-store sales this many online mail order sales this many and so on toys and so on so you don't want to include the additional fields that probably are not useful to be represented in a chart so we go under insert after we have selected the text and then we go here under charts now in this case and this is new in office 2013 there are also recommended charts and these are recommended charts that supposedly Microsoft considers that might be more beneficial than other types of charts now uh, and it's true in this case probably bar chart would work better than a pie chart uh, usually the pie charts you'd use them in calculate in anything that is against a hundred percent we have the different slices of the pie to make it more visual and stand out but if you're using different ranges of numbers and so on then you probably you want a bar chart if you have a lot of data like that is fluctuating up and down like for example the stock market and so on for a longer period of time in that case probably you want a line chart and I'll explain the line charts you'll probably see an example in a moment here so to get back we have the selected data we click on recommended charts and Microsoft in this case is giving us some recommended options the most common ones would probably be these two top ones so you click OK and now notice it it embedded the chart somewhere around the data now in this case the best thing for you to do is actually move this out of the way and park it wherever you can resize it by using those handles and notice at this point what another thing that has happened or actually before I go to that notice here in the bottom you have the in-store sales are in blue you have the web sales which are in red and the mail order sales are in green by simply looking at these numbers it was not as visual but notice here the in-store or the boomerangs they are selling better via mail order toys are selling better through a mail order as well overall but yet kites are selling better through the website so you can come up to conclusions based on the data representation in this case so now let me get back to the other item here notice that on the very top here you have also two new tabs that opened up that is the chart tools or the contextual tools that showed up in the context of what we were doing here now in this case what you can do with that is that you can change the colors notice you have different color schemes and this is quite helpful it's somewhat 
new in 2013, you can change the different type of chart and the, the, how the data. Notice the live preview of how the data is going to look. So again, these are some enhancements and that's why you pay the money for the newer versions of Excel. And then you can also notice there are other fancier ones as well. And then uh, there are also different uh, types of formats that you can apply, like you can customize uh, each component uh, to be a different color as well, if you prefer to do so. Now, you can also change the column, the data area, you can modify it, change the chart type and moving the chart, and then additional types of layouts. So if you only to represent here, and this is what I was looking for, is a quick layout options where you can have the data or the values represented as part of the chart. Now when you're working with charts it's important to make it to bring out what you want to demonstrate rather than having too much information in your charts in there. For example that would be too busy notice the information on the right hand side there. Now in this case notice you have the lines added to it. In this other case, you actually have the data right below the chart as well. So that might be helpful in giving a better understanding as to what's happening where. So that's one type of chart. That's the, the bar chart that you just saw. Uh, there are other charts as well. If you go here and the, you could have data very similar to this. So you select it again and you go under insert. And you can either pick a chart depending on how you like it and what you want manually here under the charts, or you can again use the recommended charts. So let's see the recommended. Notice in this case it's line chart or bar chart or another type of line chart. So pick any of them that you want. Click OK. And notice that was the best one that Microsoft determined that it would work in your environment depending on the data that you have. And again, you can change that to however you like it. For this other one, you again pick the data and then you go under insert. Again, you could try recommended charts. And in that case, it's giving you a couple of varieties here because it's only four items. It's four quarters for the whole year. So this would probably be applied through the pie chart here. But again, it's uh, you'll notice here it's they are pretty very much equal to each other. So maybe still in this case, one of those other charts would be more effective to point out which quarter had the best earnings. Okay. And then, of course, you have another type here. You could have charts very similar to this, where you have two sets of data, and you can compare each set of data, revenue versus expenses, in one bar. Again, it's just a matter of playing with all of these different options and what data represents what you want to demonstrate and what looks more visual. And of course, there are also scattered charts too, but in this case, you'll probably not really use this that much. You want something like that. And that's an example of a line chart. During the stock market, how it fluctuates, you use the line chart and then pie charts for other functionality and bar charts as needed. But the idea is that you create them the same way you manipulate them the same way, double click on the chart and then go and tinker with all of these different options, format it differently, customize it, change the design of it and make it bring out the data and what you're trying to prove. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to do cross sheet calculations in Excel 2013. By that, what I mean is that how to take data, for example, from different months you have, let's say, January expenses that you're keeping track, let's say, of training expenses for January office supplies and so on. And then you, let's say, you have another sheet called for February data, then another one for March and so on. So now on one of them, you want to get those totals so that you know where your budget stands throughout the year as the expenses are being accumulated 
you have snapshot as to what's happening. So the idea um, again is you enter the data, for example, here on let's say January 1st, and you spend let's say $200. And I'm not going to put the dates here for the sake of time here, but uh, let's say so you're keeping track, your assistant is keeping track of all this stuff throughout the month. By the way, this could be laid out a variety of different ways. It doesn't have to be laid out this way. You can have various columns, you can have various formatted, but the idea is that you are keeping track of your expenses throughout the month as to what you're purchasing. Now for each category here, you want to have probably the total. So over here, I want to post the total of my expenses for January. So I could do the total. Again, this is what we covered earlier. You can do a sum and then open parentheses and then select the whole range all the way to office supplies. Even though it's blank, leave it, uh, make sure you include it. In this case, it says 500. So let's say on another day, I, uh, day I went and spent $400 on computer training. Now notice my total here has changed to 900. It was 400 before and now it's 900. So now I go also under office supplies. I put a similar formula in there as well. In this case, we have to do it manually. So we go and say, equal sign sum and the same way that we did it before hit enter that's 1420 so now we go back to our main one to the summary sheet and let's say in here for training for january i want to post that value from my other worksheet to this one there are a couple ways to do this but the easiest is by using of course a formula so here's how it works. And let me demonstrate the concept before I do it yet in the calculation there. So let's say on this cell, and let me do a easy one up here, B2, let's say I have a value of 50. Now, if I go under K here or K3, let's say it doesn't matter, it can be anywhere. If I want to represent the value that is in this cell on B2 and post it over here, to represent it with the formula, I have to do three things. I have to put my equal sign. I have to put the reference by clicking on it. That's one way of doing it. And then the third thing is by pressing enter. So equal sign, reference, by clicking on it, and then enter. Notice it's 50. Now if I change it over here, make that 60. Notice it updates to 60. So now, to get the value from the January worksheet for training total, what we have to do is, remember this example, equal sign, we go to January, you know, whatever sheet it is, you click on the value that has the formula with all the different calculations here, and then you hit enter, that's that simple. Now this 900, if I want to do office supplies, Again, very similar to like this one before. Try this in your computer with the simple way first. Equal sign. You go to wherever you want to get the data. You click on it. Notice, again, it's a calculated value here. And you simply hit enter. It's 1240. Now, if I go back to January as time goes on, and let's say I added here another $1,500. Somebody wanted the computer. That cost $1,500. Hit enter. Notice now my total for office supplies is $2,700. If I go back to my summary sheet, notice it has been posted automatically. So that's the beauty of Excel, that you can take value posted somewhere else in, the, in your spreadsheet, in another sheet, worksheet, and embed that value and keep those numbers always up to date by the computer calculating them automatically as you add more content to that. The trick there is when you do this calculation, make sure you include the empty cells. Now this, this is ready to be populated. And then the trick as well, the other one is when you enter them here, three steps, equal sign, go and click where the, where the value is, and press enter and that should do it so basically then from here you just keep track of your budgets you say the sum 
and when your boss says what were the expenses for January you always know it's 3640 you could have another one what's your allocated budget let's say the allocated budget is six thousand dollars and now you say difference you do equal sign you want the original budget minus the existing expenses you have $2,300 left to be spent for January. So that's how it kind of works. I'm not going to populate the rest of it. I hope you get the idea as to how this works. In this brief video, I'm going to demonstrate how to calculate percentages in Excel 2013, which is also part of Office 365. It's the same process. So let's say you made an investment of $1,000 at the beginning of the year. On January 1st, you invested $1,000. At the end of the year, your statement came back and you chose the right company and you got $1,200. The difference in this case would be $1,200 minus $100. So that'll be that, the second number, minus the first investment. So that's the difference. So we basically, at the end of the year, we made $200. Now, in our simple way of thinking, that would be basically we made 20% in our investment. Now, how do we represent this via formula in Excel? So this is how you do it, basically. The idea is that you have the initial investment, the final report, you get the difference between the two of them, and then you divide it by the initial investment. So it would be equal sign, the difference between the two. So it would be, in this case, we're not going to worry about this manual calculation that we did earlier. So I'm going to hide that for now. So it doesn't confuse us. So the calculation in this way, you do it equal sign. And we want to use parentheses in this case because we want to do that uh, subtraction or the difference first. So we have the end of the year number minus the initial investment divided the slash by the initial investment. So we want to compare what the result was against what we put in the pot to start with. Hit enter. Now notice it says 0.2. The next thing that we need to do here is, and we can do this for formatting the whole column, we can format this into a percentage by simply clicking on the percentage sign. So that's calculating in the percentages. Now what you could have done as well is you could have formatted this initially as percentage and then the calculation would still have been 20 that we saw. Now based on this formula again it was equal the final investment minus the initial one divided by the initial one. So if you're invested initially, if you invested, uh, let's say $1,000, and at the end of the year, your statement was 900, then your value here, and I'm gonna use the autofill feature here for some of the examples, you lost 10%. Let's say that you want 21.5% or 20.5%. The way you increase those zeros is by clicking on these options right here. So in this case, we lost 10%. Now, if you had an event and you had, let's say, a training event, uh, let's say you had 17 people show up the first time, and then uh, you had 22 for the second event, this means you had a 29% increase in your enrollment. Or if your college, first year had 1200 students and then on the second year you had 1312 students now your enrollment increased by nine percent pretty easy as you can see at this point how to calculate the percentages i think once you have the formula correct to start with if you have a lower number like we demonstrated earlier let's say you had 1200 students to start with now you have 980 your enrollment has gone down by 18 percent now if you're wondering as to what these are uh, these other values here that's an error message saying that it couldn't do the calculation because there's nothing to be calculated there's no values in there so you could clean this out
So hopefully that makes sense and hopefully it's helpful for you. Leave comments if you have any questions. In this session, I'm going to go over some of the formulas and functions in Excel and particularly focus on the if statement. As we are working here on this spreadsheet and getting an understanding of different functionality of Excel and things of that nature, if we go here under formulas, notice there is a whole bunch of different sets of formulas or categories of formulas. So the other sum, some of the stuff that we covered earlier, recently used financial ones, logical ones, if and so on, text ones, date and time, lookup and math and so on. So if you want to look at all of them, notice there's a whole bunch that we had discussed a little bit earlier as well. It's probably about 400 or more that we'll not be able to cover in this tutorial. If you needed to learn about something, so I want to learn about the if statement, notice the if statement can be used to check whether a condition is met and if it is met, then it returns one value, so if it's true, and if it's not, then it returns something else. Those values can be text, like a word, or it could be a specific value, like for a bonus, apply a bonus, or not apply a bonus, or a deduction. Or... So again, what you need to do is to learn more about these, is that you, you find whatever the function that you're looking for, you click on help on this function, and then look at some of the examples from Microsoft help system here. So let me press cancel here. And now we have this example here. So we have a bunch of employees. They are salespeople that in some of the stores that kind of are somewhat frustrating. You go to a store and they bug you for buying something and you just want to check things out on your own. But in any case, so you have these salespeople and you're saying that if your sales reach $20,000 or more, then you're going to get a bonus of $500. If they don't reach 20,000 or more, then you don't get anything. So now you can apply this if statement formula in these cells. So we want to determine here whether this is true or false, whether John Smith has made more than 20,000 in sales. So we can determine that, of course, by looking at it, we can say, yes, that's true. However, we want to uh, have the computer tell us because it could be another type of value. It could be a lot of references and all that type of stuff. So in this case, we're going to use the uh, if statement to determine this. So one of the ways that are the easiest way to use this at this point is to go here under the formulas tab and then either locate it under the list of functions that we displayed a moment ago, or you can go here under logical functions and click on the if statement. So you click on the logical test here. So you're saying the test is, so if the sales, in this case, it will be B6. Actually, you can click on the value b6 just click on it if b6 is greater than or equal to you could either put a value there like 20,000 but you don't want to put it as part of formula like we had determined before greater than or equal to this is our hurdle this is what the criteria is 20,000 which would be b12 then if that is true we want the computer to tell us it's true just the word true. If it's not, then we say write false. Now, one thing as well to keep in mind, notice that we were referencing a specific cell and we'll probably use autofill here. So it is suggested that you make this B12 an absolute reference by putting the dollar signs in there. So we click OK. Notice the computer told us, yes, it is true. He will get a bonus. And let me do this again manually. You go under if statement and you say logical test. You go to the value that you want to compare. So this is what Michael did. If his amount is greater or equal to the hurdle, which is, or the criteria, which is B12 in this case, so I put an F4 to make it absolute reference, then I say again, it's true. Or you can put whatever you want. And then otherwise, give me this false. So now I click OK. Notice 
that's less than 20,000 and I can replicate this otherwise I'll be here all day notice only certain ones get through here if the criteria here it's less let's say it's 18,000 now notice only one of them will not get a bonus now the next one that we want to do here is do they get a bonus yes or no by the way you don't have to do all these three criteria. usually you just put it right here under the bonus amount and you're done but I just want to demonstrate how this is kind of done. So we go here under formulas again, under logical, we go under if statement, and then we click on the amount greater than, equal, and then the criteria, make that absolute, then we say yes, otherwise it's no. Click OK, so the first one gets a bonus, the other ones will find out, and there it is. Now we want to do the actual calculation. So the actual calculation, we can click on F here again, pick the uh, what we want to compare, greater, equal, whatever the criteria, make it absolute, and then if it's true, then give them an additional $500. So you give them whatever the value is here. So you want to give them 500. Again, we are referencing a single point for all of these customers or all of these employees so make that an absolute value. Again, otherwise give them zero. So then we click OK. We scroll down and there it is. You could use this criteria in a variety of different ways. You could use it if somebody participates in an event, yes or no, based on what. If somebody donated enough money for a specific cause, you could have a criteria and if statement and then you can send them something. You could generate something like for a mail merge and things of that nature by using the if statement. So it's very powerful. Uh, play with it. I'll post the spreadsheet with the video as well. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to use some of the commonly used financial functions in Excel. And this will be the payment rate, the interest payment rate, and the principal payment rate. And this primarily has, to, of course, to do with mortgages and things of that nature. There are a lot of different financial calculations, and you can see them here under the financial column or category under the formulas area. And as you can see, it's a lot of them. So let's assume that we are taking a loan for 600000 for our business. And the loan is going to be for the 6% rate. Nowadays, it's actually lower, a little bit lower, maybe like 3%. And usually, uh, they'll tell you, and that 3%, it's APY. You probably have seen that, the interest payment per year. So what that means is it's going to be for 12 months of that year, and that is 3% for 12 months. And that means that for each month, that interest payment, it's going to be, let's say at 3%, it's going to be this rate. You can kind of see it over here. So it will be, you're dividing B2, which is the rate that you're getting, dividing it by 12 months. If you're getting a mortgage for a home, your mortgage would be, let's say, for a fixed 30 years or 20 years or whatever it may be. So in this case, you have the number of years. Then you have to calculate that for number of payments that you have to make over 30 years. So in this case, for example, you have 30 years times 12 months per year that means it's you have 360 payments for that loan of six hundred thousand dollars and then PV is the present value of that loan so that's the amount that you're getting so when you're doing these financial calculations usually the formula as you'll see right here so if we want to get the payment per month here and I'll do a search for PMT You'll notice that it uses the rate value. It needs the NPER, the number of payments, the present value. Basically, you just need these the first three pieces here. So the reason why we had to do all of these other calculations was because the rate, it wants the rate 
per month and then the NPER it is the number of payments overall for the lifetime of the loan and then the present value is that so so the way you do it you go back here under insert function we have PMT you could search up here of course double click on it and then we want the rate then we want also the NPER the number of payments and then the PV it's the present value what's your loan and then the FV and that type of stuff is a future value and so on you don't need to worry about those for this calculation notice they're not in bold there so then we click OK and our first payment or the monthly payment it would be for six hundred thousand dollars alone for 30 years at three percent it would be two thousand five hundred twenty nine dollars now let's suppose that you didn't get it at three percent because your credit was not that great you got it at six percent because you just decided to go on vacation every so often you hit enter notice same amount same length of time but your payment almost doubled per month and that's because your interest rate it's almost doubled now let's do this at less so let's say you're buying a house for two hundred thousand dollars your payment at 6%, it would be $1,199, almost $2,000 a month. And if you are able to get a better rate, interest rate, let's say at 4%, notice your rate will go down at 954. So you get the idea if you were to buy a car, let's say, and you want to look for a car and the car cost $19,000. You can do the calculation exactly the same way of course nowadays you can get the iphone out and just search it but and let's say you're getting for five years which would be five here the number of years and let's say it was four percent that's 349 dollars a month and but if it is seven percent for whatever reason you're paying 376 a month and then if you had a credit card debt of $19,000 and you're paying let's say initially 14% that's 442 every month and then if you're paying 29% you're paying 603 a month so you get the idea that what loans and what how that all that works so let's go back to a house example here let's say 4% it's going to be over 30 years and it's a $200,000 loan or mortgage your payment is 954 a month so that's payment per month so that PMT it's rate number of payments and the PV you can also calculate the interest payment how much are you paying in interest every month out of this 954 how much is the bank making the first month that you got it so here's how you calculate the and let's do that calculation down here under IPMT. We go under formulas, we click on insert function, and we are going to search for IPMT. And then double click on it. We choose the rate. Here is our rate. The period for which you want to find the interest. So the period would be the first payment, let's say. So it's slightly different. It's not going to be posted here so it's going to be let's say the first payment that you're going to make and then the NPER it's this number number of payments over the lifetime of the thing of the loan and then you have also the present value and then you just click OK so number one there was the first payment we want to find the interest that you're going to pay on the first payment of your new house that you just bought notice out of $954 a month six hundred sixty seven dollars almost is interest on that first payment that's why it's important to save the money for the first payment for the mortgage and so on now if you wanted to find out how much interest you're going to pay let's say at the end of the first year all you have to do is you come here to your formula and you say on the 12th payment 
and on the 12th payment it was only 655 instead of 667 so now let's change this back to the first payment so we get an idea here and now for here we're going to figure out what the principal payment would be for the first time it's basically going to be the difference between these two so how much are you paying for the actual loan of two hundred thousand dollars so in this case you just click on again under formulas insert function and then your function there will be ppmt principal payment amount click ok so our rate again it's that we want to find uh, the principal payment on the first time that you are paying this loan the first payment in the beginning and you can change it of course to the last one if you want it NPER it's the number of payments for the duration of the loan so if it's 30 years it's going to be 360 months and then the PV it's the value of the loan and then we leave the rest alone here we click OK notice only $288 out of $200,000 your $200,000 loan go to your actual loan amount the rest is interest on the first payment pretty depressing so you now you get the idea is how this some of this stuff works and just see how you can explore the other functions here as well financial functions of course as business majors or as other users out there in business you can just see what they do and of course google them or find a rate and all that type of stuff so that's financial calculations in brief in this video i'm going to demonstrate how to use a name manager and incorporate that in the various formulas in an excel spreadsheet so there are cases where you need to calculate something for example you have this area here and we're going to call this january expenses and then let's say the total here would be equal sum and then we learned this earlier that's nine hundred dollars basically so then let's say also that we have in another spot somewhere else we have february expenses now let's say you are referencing this somewhere else in our spreadsheet across uh, multiple worksheets and things of that nature so we learned about that in an earlier video as well and let's say uh, for the sake of simplicity here i'm going to try to reference them here so i could say annual summary and i could say january so now one way for me to represent here what the expenses for january were is by simply putting equal sign and then of course i could just get the total from here and just see c9 that's one way of doing it another way would be to do the equal sign and then add these numbers all over again actually the equal sign and sum that comes back to 900 or another way that I want to demonstrate here is to actually say this value here I want to just name this as the January expenses so that wherever I reference it throughout my spreadsheet my complicated spreadsheet instead of me going and finding the exact location I could just call it by its name January expenses so the way to do this is basically we select where the formula is for the January expenses or the January total we go here under formulas and then we go under define name and we call this January okay you could put comments as well and what it's saying is that it's just creating a, a quick name for this location just use text in there so now we notice it says January total now if we want to get the February as well so we go here and we click on define name you could also use the, the name manager here as well where you can create and edit names for the workbook you can just rename the stuff that you have from before we click here on define name and we call it February so in this case I want to use a previous name that I have so we click on equal sign and then notice here under formulas we have this use in formula 
we could if we know the name for it we can just press January here and then double click on it or we could click on using formula and it has all the other predefined names from before or for name ranges so let's say I want January total double click hit enter then I go and pick also equal sign here and I want to get the content for February and there it is now I want to get the total the total of course I could calculate now this plus that since it's only two numbers you could use a plus or you could use a sum function as well so now I could even give this a new name if I want it by defining the name you say why are we doing all of this well, well the nice thing about it is that you could be on completely a different worksheet here so let me go back to the beginning I could be over here and let's say I want the January total instead of me going and finding it wherever in whatever worksheet it is I could simply do equal sign go under formulas go using formula choose January total hit enter it's 900 wherever it is so it's updated so you're basically creating these names or these pointers or identifiers for specific ranges of calculations and then applying those in other areas without having to know the exact reference for them so it's very helpful in this session i'm going to demonstrate how you can use predefined drop down lists as somebody or your assistant or you're entering data in excel so that the data that you entered is consistently spelled and it's consistently listed correctly based on a previously defined list so in this case let's say we have a sales rep and you have four or five salesmen and you're constantly entering and re-entering those names and you want to make sure that those names are all the time spelled appropriately so what you can do is and you can use this for products and other things as well what you can do is in another sheet in your spreadsheet here you can just create the names define the names so we have hubert mark john samantha and mimi and so on so now here when you're entering it you want always hubert to be spelled correctly or to have a drop down list of names so we have this uh, column here so now what you do is you go under data here under data we want to do data validation so basically the data validation in this case is that it picks from a list of rules to limit the type of data that can be entered in a cell it can be numbers it could be a list of names and so on like i mentioned earlier so we click on data validation and we choose data validation here and then under what to allow you right now it's to allow any value in this column however we can go here under choose and choose a list only a list of predefined names can be allowed to be entered in there so then we go here and it's saying where is your source where is your list of data and then you simply go to the sheet that has the list of names in this case it's sheet number four for me and we go over right here now you could pick a little bit of extra space here so that if you add another name in the future you have the capability without having to change the de design of the spreadsheet you can leave some of blank areas here so then we click OK and now notice we are back to sheet number three so now we are entering sales reps instead of you typing Tom notice it doesn't allow you to do that it says a user has restricted values that can be entered here so now you have this drop down list you have hubert mark john and so on so we click on hubert and then you put the date and the item and all that type of stuff of course date shouldn't be allowed like that either so you can customize that for the next one so you go to the next one and next one and so on now if for some reason you wanted to add another client or salesperson remember we had we specified a couple extra cells here so we go here we added it on the list now we go back and over here Jonathan is listed as one of the salespeople so you can use this for products predefined products for your salespeople and so on 
In this session, I'm going to briefly cover a little bit about pivot tables. Pivot tables are just tools, another way or another tool in Excel, and it is under the Insert tab here, that allows you to look at the data from various angles and various points of view. For example, you can look as to how the sales are going for a specific product, for a specific customer, from a specific salesperson, for a specific region, and analyze it, getting the totals, the sums, and the various financial calculations there, or arithmetic calculations as well. So there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind as far as the pivot tables. The pivot tables, the field names and the column headers must be on the first row. So you see here you have these headings here. So that's one criteria. The records must be in rows. So you can't have them a different way, you know, like having these labels here on the left and then the data on the right of these columns. The other one is that it should, you shouldn't have any blank columns, rows, or field names. So you want to have no blanks in the data set. And then the data must be surrounded by blank columns and rows and or Excel worksheet columns or row headers. So basically you just have some empty space around it. So, All right. So. In this case, this is our data. Now, what you do is, with this data, you go under the Insert tab, and then you can either insert an, a pivot table. So basically, it's to easily arrange and summarize complex data in a pivot table. So in this case, you could either click to design your own table, or you can click on Recommended Tables based on the data that Microsoft determines or can identify in this table. It will recommend certain tables. Let me select it first. Usually you don't have to select it, but just to be sure that it doesn't interfere with other stuff. Okay, notice it's about 2,000 records here. And now we click on Recommended Pivot Tables. And notice you have different types of, of sorting of the information or the, the pivot table here. So, or pre-designed. So basically it's doing them by here by region and then the sum here or you could go and pick another one by region or you could have another one by the different sales people and the sum of their sales and the cost of goods and all that type of stuff with a grand total in the end and uh, so you basically just pick and choose here you have the different companies and the amounts that they purchased and so on so this is really what's valuable in the new version of Excel 2013, these predefined, like in the previous versions, you had to go and design it yourself. Here you can just pick one of those designs, click OK, and notice at this point, it has basically opened a new sheet here for us with the salespeople and the amounts. Now, if you wanted to add more stuff to this pivot table, you can simply choose, let's say, customer here, and notice for Chin, it's going to list also the customer, or for Jerry as well, the customers. Now, if I want it also the region, it's going to subdivide them by region as well. So notice it's building this on the fly. Man, check region. Let me go to date. So it puts also the dates here. So you have the salesperson, the company, and then the date for each sale. Now we could also go here and specify different filters if we want it, or we can choose more tables to be included in there. Under columns, you could remove fields, you could add more fields in there. The idea here is that you can tinker with this in a variety of ways by either adding components, looking at it different ways. And so let's say I get the sales rep out of there. Now we have it by date. But then I want to have, let's say, so it's customer and so on. But then I want to see only the products. And then I want to filter them by date and the customer. So now under date here, so this is a filter option. I could go and choose only for a specific day what was sold. Or I could go and choose multiple days or multiple criterias. 
So here's another way before I end this by having them having them by region here. And notice I had them filtered. I'm going to choose all of them to show all of them. So now we have by region, by amount, and so on. We could get rid of the amount thingy there. And we could have, let's say, products. So we want region, product, and let's say, let's say we want next region, we want the sales rep. Notice we have Midwest, Chin, and then so on. You can see how easy it is to manipulate the data and look at it from all kinds of different ways. In this brief tutorial, I'm going to explain a couple of things as far as printing and a couple of concepts related to the page layout and printing in Microsoft Excel 2013. So unlike a document in Word where you choose to press print and the whole page prints out, in Excel it's slightly different. One of the concepts is that you have to set the print area. So otherwise it will not just print everything in your worksheet and the whole worksheet which could be too big in any case so to set the print area you just simply select the content that you want it to be printed and then you go under the page layout and you choose print area and then choose set print area in some cases you have to clear it first you clear the print area, whatever was selected before is going to be ignored. And from here, you're just saying that whenever I want to print this, it's going to print only this area that I had defined. If you wanted to look at the print area as to what will be printed, press file, choose print. And then notice here on the print preview, that's the only thing that is going to be printed or that we selected earlier. You can click also under page setup from this view here and then customize here as to what you want the margins to be and what you want the header and footer to be. So you could go and say I want a custom header and you can put like a page number or the name of the report or whatever you want a picture or whatever as part of the header and you can do the same thing as part of the footer as well. And you can determine as to where you want the headers and the footers in the document. The other way to get to this view is to go under the page layout here. And you can go under the print title option right here. And choose what the title you want, what header and footer you want, what margins, and what the page should look like. So it's pretty much the same idea like... I showed you from the print view earlier. In some cases where the, you want the text to fit in one page, whether it's width and so on, you can adjust that by the fit to option right here under fit to one page tall by one page wide and so on. So that's a couple of other options. Then under the page layout here, you can go under margins and choose custom margins if you'd prefer for printing orientation you change it here under the page layout as well to print in landscape or portrait you can also put page breaks and also background if need be which i doubt that you would need to in general now another thing is since we are here in the page layout what you can do is you can apply themes so that your document looks professional by color coordinating all the components in your spreadsheet so you simply pick one of those designs and notice how it changes the color coordination throughout the worksheet notice even the color of the tabs in the bottom by the live preview here it changes it automatically now notice also in the bottom here there is a page layout view so you can click on page layout and it's going to give you an idea as to if you were to print all the pages this is what it would look like for printing this is also another easier way to add a header to your document or to your spreadsheet when you print it out and you can also change the margins from here manually and that was by clicking on the page layout option you can change between the two options in the bottom here so that should explain how to use the page layout and some of the components for the formatting and the printing of the spreadsheet 
In this session, I'll briefly show you how to link data from an Excel spreadsheet into a Word document for the purpose of reports and so on. So there are a couple ways to take data from Excel and then utilize it in Microsoft Word. So let's see if we can demonstrate it very quickly here. So we go to Word and let's say this is my report. Let's say I have to do this report monthly and I have to take data from Excel and, and put it in my report for whether it is expenses or it could be whatever else. So one of the ways to get the data from Excel into Word is by simply clicking on saving this. So copying it from Excel and then I'm right clicking and choose copy or control C or however you copy stuff or click on copy and paste up here and then I go back to Word and then I'm going to paste it. Now notice by simply pasting it in Word it does not look anywhere close to what it was in Excel. Of course I could go here and choose to use the destination or the keep the source formatting. So that's one way it's not the greatest way. Now what you can do is you can actually link the data with the Excel spreadsheet. So once you link it once as the data is updated from time to time from Excel from your assistant or whoever else out there that report it's always up to date. All you have to do is open up the document and it will be up to date. So for that to work what you do is you go into Excel we copy and we select and copy the data so I'm just copying it again those bars were there because I had copied it from before. Now we go back to Word and we click here under Paste, but instead of just choosing Paste, we are going to click on Paste Special. So choose Paste Special and then we're going to paste it as a link. So we are going to link it with Microsoft Excel. So it's linked to an Excel spreadsheet object. So basically the data is not really residing. It's of course posted in the document, but it's linked with the Excel document. So I'll demonstrate in a moment here. Since we pasted it, we can assume that the report is done. We're gonna save it. And we're gonna save it on the desktop. I call it this my monthly report. Now a month has passed by or whatever time has passed by and Notice my, uh, let's say my training expense for January in the previous report was $100 before. Now I'm going to make it $123. Now if I go to my document, and let's say I'll save it. Let's assume that a few months passed by. Now I go into my report. Double click on it. Notice the first thing that you'll get is it says this document contains links that refer to other files. Do you want to update this document or the data from the linked files? It's saying it's linked to Excel. Do you want this to be updated? So I say yes. And now this is my older junk here that I had from before. But notice the expense here for January for 123 has been updated. So the idea is that whatever you change here in Excel as you're keeping track of things, it will be automatically posted and linked with Microsoft Word because we linked that data earlier. So if I go into Word, close it, and then save the Excel changes that I made, open it up again, say yes to update it, Again, ignore this part. Notice even the formatting has been updated from Excel. So it's a pretty neat tool. It's highly recommended that you utilize it in your work. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to import data from a CSV file or a text file. The CSV files are used quite a bit in larger businesses and corporations for transferring data between systems. It's a common file format 
that is utilized for transferring files. This is an example of a CSV file. It's called CSV because it's comma separated values. So notice these would be the columns. The system will know where the columns are separated by the comma when we bring this into Excel. So let's go back and we'll try to import that. Let me take note where it is located. Now the way you bring it in is by clicking on file, click on open and then go and find the file basic. So we'll go under my computer or computer, click on browse, we'll go under downloads, go wherever it is located and we're going to choose here to show us all files. So notice it's invoices list. Double click on it. Now you'll be presented with this wizard. Basically it's saying this is a CSV file or a comma or a delimited uh, text delimited file. So we are telling it, okay, it's text delimited. Usually you'd know that by whoever, wherever you got the, of course, the file to tell you what, whether it's comma delimited or tab delimited it could be either one of them. Now you check this option here for my data has headers. What that means is that the first row of your data actually has the labels as to what that column stands for. Then we click on next. Then we tell the system that this is comma separated values. So the commas are what separate each field. Uh, if it was tab uh, delimited or semicolon delimited or something else, uh, you'd choose that. But uh, most of them are usually comma separated. Then you click on next. Then you could specify additional types of formatting here. Usually it's not necessary. And then you click on finish. Now at this point, that data from a text file has been imported into Excel. And notice I'm double clicking between the columns to make them fit correctly. Notice it's much cleaner. And now you can tinker with this data. You can create charts. You can create whatever you want to create, filter it and all that type of stuff. You save it, it's done. Let's choose save as here, browse where we want to save it. And then we don't want it as a tab delimited, we want to save it as an Excel file. So we go here under Excel workbook and give it a name. It's going to name it listed as invoices list, which is fine. And now it's an Excel format, just like any other Excel spreadsheet. Now at this point, if for some reason, let's assume this is a spreadsheet that you created in Excel. Now you want to send it to somebody in comma separated values, very similar to how we got it earlier. Now we click on file, choose save as, and then click on browse. Under this, the save as file type, this is where you tell it that it's going to be CSV, comma delimited file. Click on CSV, give it a name, and then click on save. And you want to keep using it, say yes. If we were to go back to that folder, notice it's with commas. So that's how you bring a file in. You bring it in from CSV and you export into a CSV. In this brief video, I'm going to explain how you can share and export or even print a file, an Excel file into a PDF format directly from Excel. So let's assume that this is our file that we wanted. And the first thing that you do is you click on file here and then you choose share. Under share, you can share it with email or invite other people to work with you on this document, but you'd have to have OneDrive configured and you also have to save this file to the cloud, basically to the Microsoft cloud, or you can share it as an attachment, directly send it to somebody from here, or you can send it as PDF format directly from here as well. The other option you can do is you can export it directly into PDF, and this is how the easiest way to print something into PDF without having to have a PDF creator or Adobe or any of that type of stuff. So we click on export, create PDF, and we choose where we want to save it, give it a name, and then it will save it in PDF format. Now, of course, it chose to print there only the area that we had selected to print from earlier on the print area. 
So that's how you print directly to PDF and share a file in Excel. Thank you.